The hotly contested debates over whether or not to keep COVID-19 lockdowns in place continues across Canada. Our guest today joins me now from Calgary via Zoom. John Carpe is the president of the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms. John, you're launching legal action against the federal government over the fact that Canadian residents will be required to quarantine at their own expense after returning from international travel, regardless of their negative COVID-19 status. Can you explain? Since late January, the Justice Centre has been contacted by people all across Canada that are being forcibly detained, uh, even in some cases with a negative COVID test and they have no access to a lawyer. They're taken to a secret location. They're cut off from their family. Their family is not allowed to know where they are, uh, not allowed to speak with each other by telephone. And uh, the detention, the imprisonment is not reviewed by a judge, which is normally what happens when the, if the police lock you up because you're you know, accused of, of shoplifting or even accused of murder, the, if you're detained somewhere, it goes before a judge for a ruling as to whether the detention can continue or whether you should be allowed out until the time of your trial. So right now in Canada, somebody accused of murder has more legal rights than a Canadian coming back to Canada on an airplane. You know, that is very concerning. And there are cases where Canadian families are telling you that their loved ones who've returned from overseas are being held at federal isolation sites. The government is refusing to tell husbands or wives where these sites are, how we can contact them. How, John, how is this happening in our country, in Canada? I think it's just the uh, fanatical extremist uh, attitude that says that, you know, it, it doesn't matter what we do, as, as long as we're fighting against COVID, everything's okay. We've got no rights, no freedoms, you know, any amount of unemployment or the suffering that people experience when they're forced into isolation or, you know, mental, mental health harm on children or drug overdoses, suicides. Uh, there, there's this attitude like it, it, it doesn't matter uh, because even if it saves one life, it's worth it. And there's just an unfounded fear of the virus that's not grounded in reality because anybody who takes the time to actually look at the government data and the govern, government statistics will know that this is not the unusually deadly killer that we were uh, told about back in March of 2020. So it's the fear factor that causes a lot of respect for our basic human rights and fundamental freedoms and human dignity. And, you know, sadly, there are some, some Canadians think it's just fine for the government to lock up people, even when there's no reason why they cannot quarantine at home. Now, if Canadian citizens are being held against their will by their own government without even having committed a crime, doesn't it make sense that any human being should at the very least have access to a lawyer? It should, and it does under the Charter. Uh, this is why the government now seems to be backtracking a little bit on its uh, policy. But in the meantime, we're still moving ahead on getting our court action ready because when the government, when the policy actually becomes law officially, that's when we're going to take it to court. What's interesting, we recently interviewed an Edmonton couple, the Mathis family. Uh, Nicole came back from Dallas, Texas to the Calgary airport. She was whisked away. And again, uh, her husband like, what's going on? You know, the people who took her away, the police didn't tell her husband exactly where they were taking her to this isolation facility. Turned out she had the wrong COVID test. She had the antigen test when instead it should have been the PCR test. So instances like this, we're hearing it over and over again, John. Can people like the Mathis family sue the federal government? Well, the, the Mathis, uh, Mathis family, Nikki Mathis is one of our clients and we're going to have, uh, we're already at a half dozen clients and we're getting more emails. Uh, so the number will be larger. So we are going to sue uh, at least over what's happened in the past so we can get a proper court declaration that what happened was an unjustified violation of Nikki Mathis's uh, charter freedoms. But the other part of the court action would be to challenge the policy itself. Now, if the government really cleans up its act, uh, you know, the, the second part of it might not be necessary. But you mentioned the PCR tests. Uh, there are medical experts and infectious disease specialists who question the legitimacy of the PCR tests, that uh, they were never designed to diagnose COVID. And uh, they're, they're just not 
accurate or reliable. So this is another thing we'll bring up in court. Why is the federal government relying on uh, tests that are not accurate and not reliable as a basis to deprive people of their liberty? And this part of your basic human dignity is your freedom to go where you want, when you want, to be out and about, to not be locked up somewhere is, uh, is a very important charter freedom. John Carpe is the president of the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, joining me right now from Calgary. John, let's talk about what's happening in Quebec. A curfew has been imposed. People are basically under house arrest. Is this constitutional or even legal? No, and we have the same lack of science. The Premier of Quebec was asked during a news conference whether uh, this 8 p.m. curfew was going to really make a difference in terms of the spread of the virus. And his response was, we don't know. <laughs> so the, here you have this kind of fanatical extremist attitude that, you know, even if something, we don't even know for sure if it's going to help, but we're going to lock you up in your house, even though we don't know if it's going to be helpful. But the, the science tells us that COVID does not spread outdoors. And uh, we, it's also rather ridiculous to think that, that COVID spreads more quickly, more dangerously after 8 p.m. I mean, there's absolutely no science for keeping people locked up in their houses and issuing uh, tickets uh, and arresting and charging people for being outside of their own home after eight o'clock. There's just no reason for it. There's no validity to it. It's unscientific. And yet a lot of Canadians support this because they're terrified of the virus. And so anything, even something use, useless and unscientific, anything uh, that, that might possibly perhaps help, we should just pursue it. And, and there's this utter lack of, of respect for our human dignity and fundamental freedoms. So we're turning into a police state and a medical dictatorship. We're 11 months into this. And there's no reason to think that, you know, by, by June or September or, or next Christmas that we're going to be out of this. You know, I used to work up in Ottawa on Parliament Hill as a national parliamentary reporter for the Sun News Network, the now defunct SNN. And I kept in contact with a lot of my friends in the media in Ottawa on the hill there. And one of my friends, he's a, a shooter editor, a video journalist, Mark. He was out at a skating rink outside in Ottawa by himself wearing his mask. I'm like, why are you wearing your mask? There's nobody around you to physically do You're, oh, no, We're supposed to, Hal. You're supposed to wear the mask. Even outside when there's nobody around you? So, I mean, maybe the fear is in a lot of people, including the media. Now, let's talk about the mainstream media. It's, you know, they still seem to be very supportive of the lockdown measures, John, but I've noticed more stories from medical professionals who are voicing concerns about the negative effects of the lockdowns. And I mean, they can't be really good for our mental, spiritual, or physical health. No, and I'm, that's one thing I'm thankful for because unfortunately the, the mainstream media are a pro-lockdown propaganda machine. They frighten people with uh, citing all these numbers of, of so-called cases, but in fact, uh, in, in, in the use of the English language prior to March of 2020, a case meant a sick person. And so you'd say there are you know, 10,000 cases of breast cancer in Canada, that would mean 10,000 people who actually had breast cancer. Or if there was you know, 50,000 cases of the annual flu, it meant 50,000 people who were actually sick. And for a lot of people, a case still means a sick person because it, it, it did until March. And this is a twisting of the English language because the media talks about COVID cases. These are not sick people. These are people with a positive result on the PCR test. And, but for every thousand so-called cases, uh, there's about 30 sick people that need to be in hospital. So even these media headlines are fear-mongering. But on the positive side, um, more and more doctors, bit by bit by bit, you get more and more doctors that are saying, uh, look, we've got you know, serious mental health uh, problems in children who are living in a state of fear, who are told that if they get within six feet of, of a person that they might kill their grandmother, which is completely false. And you've got more and more data coming out on cancer deaths because uh, you've got the, MRIs and CT scans that are being shut down to uh, as part of the lockdown measures 
So now when people are finding out way too late, oh, you've got cancer, but you know, if you'd had a timely test, it would have been stage one, but now it's like, oh, well, I'm sorry, you've got stage two, stage three, stage four cancer. And you know, you don't need to be a doctor to know that cancer spreads and it gets worse and it needs to get caught early. And so all of these lockdown harms, um, the doctors are pointing to them more and more. And I, I hope that those will be wake up calls for people that you know, even if COVID was a, a super scary, super dangerous virus, which it is not, but even if it was, the amount of harm that lockdowns are inflicting is just killing more people than what COVID does. Now, gym owners are really angry right now that they're not being allowed to fully reopen. Do they have any legal options? Well, the, the Justice Centre has taken the governments of British Columbia, Alberta, and Manitoba to court, and uh, we will also be taking Saskatchewan and Ontario to court. Uh, unfortunately, those court actions, they always, this is terrible, but it, it takes two years, three years, four years before you eventually get a ruling. So right now, the gym owners, th their choice is to comply or to open up and risk what I imagine, depending on which province, uh, are, are very hefty fines. But there's no scientific justification for this. Uh, typically, you know, the people threatened by COVID, the people who should be afraid would be if you're uh, 82 years old and you're in a nursing home and you're already dying of cancer, heart disease, emphysema, diabetes, whatever other illnesses, then you should be worried. These are not the same people who are going to the gym. Uh, people going to the gym, if you're healthy enough to go to the gym, you're not in the high risk category of, of catching COVID or dying of COVID. So there's no scientific basis for keeping gyms closed. And this is bankrupting good, honest business people that are trying to earn a living. And the government's effectively putting many of them out of business and it's cruel. Now there is a slight uh, restriction being lifted here in Alberta where you can do one-on-one -on -one training with your, your trainer at the gym, but the trainer has to wear a mask. But as for letting everybody back into the gym, no, not yet. So John, how do provincial governments decide who can and cannot open? The complaint from small business owners who have interviewed that they've had to shut down and they may be going under is that maybe there are different rules that apply for the big box stores that are allowed to open. Walmart's never been closed since March of 2020. And that's where people congregate. And you know, if you are trying to get people to be not in touch with each other as much, uh, which again, you know, the, the virus is not a threat to 90% of Canadians. So there's no reason for 90% of people to, to live in fear. But if you are trying to disperse people into as many different businesses as possible, uh, the best way to do that is to let all businesses be open and to let all businesses pick whatever hours they want. That's where you're really going to spread people out so you don't have people close together. Uh, but in a lot of provinces, uh, you've got everybody packing into the food section of Walmart and uh, all these other places are, uh, are, are being unfairly punished. And so these distinctions are arbitrary uh, and we're still waiting on politicians to come up with some actual evidence that would suggest that these lockdowns are saving any lives. I've been watching this closely for uh, over 10 months and there's no evidence that I've seen that anybody's put forward. People assert, the politicians assert that lockdowns are saving lives, but that's not providing evidence. That's just making an assertion. John, do you have any updates now on the churches and how they're doing in their legal battles, such as what's happening with the Trinity Bible Chapel in Ontario? Trinity Bible Chapel is taking the take, taking the rap, taking the heat uh, on behalf of a lot of other churches because they have said that it's fundamentally important for them to minister to their community and minister to the uh, congregants, to the worshipers, to, to the believers. Uh, for a lot of people, church is their only family. I mean, a lot of people are living with you know, a husband or a wife or kids or parents or whatever, but a lot of Canadians are not. And uh, this is their only chance for some in-person contact. And so the government is uh, threatening contempt of court and millions of dollars of fines. And very courageously, the church is staying open in spite of those threats. So that's in Ontario. In British Columbia, we're going to court March 1st because we have a court action on behalf of churches. And we're pointing out just the hypocrisy and inconsistency of allowing restaurants to be open and strangers can go in and 
you know, eat in restaurants, but churches uh, must be totally closed, even with, uh, you know, seating restrictions and this and that. They're not allowed to open at all in British Columbia, and there's no rational or scientific basis for that. The persecution of the church continues even in the 21st century. John Carpes, the president of the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, thanks for joining me today from Calgary. Good to be with you, Hal.